Morning all. I thought it would be interesting to continue our sacrifices series and look at Jose Real Capablanca. He was a Cuban chess player who was world chess champion from 1921 to 1927. One of the greatest players of all time. He was renowned for his exceptional end game skill and speed of play. Due to his achievements in the chess world, mastery over the board and his relatively simple style of play, he was nicknamed the human chess machine. Capablanca became the world chess champion in 1921 by beating Emmanuel Lasker. He lost the title in 1927 to Alexander Alekhine. So let's have a look at five important celebrated sacrifices. These sacrifices are not of the risk taking form. Some might term them sham sacrifices in that they're not really sacrifices, not taking a risk that much. In this end game though it looks as though white has already taken a risk with this backward pawn on the C file. It looks as though it's prone to danger. Let's add a bit so through this. So if black was um, given one or two moves then this sort of stuff looks dangerous but also even coming over here uh, is potentially useful. So this rook looks active. Okay in this position Capablanca ignored his C pawn issues. He plays actively for the seventh rank. He plays this move, rook h1. So white wants to come to that seventh rank. Or even more important, maybe in this particular position, maybe rook h6 to just hit f7. Sorry, to hit g6. So here, black actually played king f8. So now the king is nearer this pawn, but it's still allowing this infiltration. So what's black's idea? Well, black really is interested in rook c6. This looks as though this, if this pawn goes, isn't this dangerous for white? Capablanca starts collecting key trump cards in this end game. Uh, so he doesn't want to defend passively. But here's the first trump card, a rook on the seventh. So he doesn't mind this rook c6. So it becomes a kind of sacrifice of c3 positionally now in this quiet end game. So what does white want to do here with this rook on the seventh? Its only pawn which is attacking is actually defended by that rook. There is a detailed video by the way called rook on the seventh on this channel if you want even more analysis of this position. Here Capablanca played g4 and it looks as though well the rook is actually tied down to g6 right now. So there's no point in giving up g6 because that would mean two connected past pawns. Okay, so for the moment we see knight c4 now, where black might be threatening something like knight e3. Or trying to run his a pawn later with a5 and maybe a pawn sack of his own to get this a pawn going. Okay, so white now plays g5, fixes this g6 pawn and the thing about this though it gives up the f5 square. So the issue with this pawn was that white was able to play bishop takes g6. So what is Capablanca doing? He's actually allowing, allowing knight e3 to f5 to protect his pawn which actually means this really does become a pawn sacrifice. Was this a blunder to play g5 here? Well, let's see, there's a subtle weakness of the last move in all this, which I'm about to show you. Knight e3 check is played. So leaving this pawn vulnerable, this pawn's still vulnerable, but now g6 is protected. Is this a total blunder to arrive at this position where c3 does seem to be dropping now without g6? This is the position of absolute extreme brilliance, simple, elegant brilliance. Capablanca has seen this position, one believes anyway. <laughs> Bishop takes f5 was played. So here if rook takes c3 check, the white king could come here and that's absolutely devastating for black. Two connected pass pawns on the way after g takes. King's already very advanced there. No, black just wants to play g takes, thinking well it's just going to get a pawn next go. Fantastic move here, very very powerful. If I give you five seconds, 
to pause the video starting from now, what would you play here? Okay, King G3. So offering C3, but improving the king. So rook takes C3, king H4. The king is coming up via the right hand corner. Or maybe G6, king G5. Black plays now rook F3. Another pawn sacrifice is needed here. How is white defending the pawn? Or if white takes here on C7, then it's a race to win pawns, isn't it? Because rook takes f4 and rook takes d4. So just to show this, this wasn't played. Rook takes c7. Black might be fine with taking. Rook takes d4. Black's getting some pass pawns here, which he might be able to use. It's not entirely clear here, even though the king's advanced. Uh, this is about equal from an engine perspective. So Capablanca has another decision here, a dynamic decision or go for material, material versus dynamism. He's more concerned about his past pawn, his G pawn. He plays G6 and wanting to be able to herd that. And it makes way for the king to be super aggressive, creating the opposition against the op opponent's king here. This pawn is taken, also offering this pawn of course, potentially. Now here, this is all very already critical for black. If rook takes d4, then this looks very dangerous after king f6. First thing mate, black seems to be in big trouble for example. He'd be losing his rook surely after g7. White is queening, winning the rook. So black faces some clear difficulties here. He tries rook e4, but then there's still king f6, threatening the mate in one. King g8. And now here, precision needed, perhaps. If rook takes c7, is this still good? It is still good for for white, but I think even maybe even a more accurate move first. Check. And now rook takes c7, keeps up the threat of mate now. Rook c8, threatening mate. So the rook goes back, and now king takes f5. A good, healthy return on investment already. Equal on pawns, but the king is more aggressive. The rook is on the seventh. This pawn is aggressive. We see rook e4, and now king f6, threatening mate again. Rook f4 check, king e5. This pawn is weak. Rook g4. White now welcomes a transition to a king and pawn ending by playing g7 check. If this is taken, then it's a simply, uh, simply winning king and pawn ending. This pawn is queening long before black uses the pawn's hair. For example, take, we can take hair. We take this pawn and then we create the opposition to make sure that black is not blockading hair. With king c7, for example. But uh, this, this is easily uh, winning. Now here, actually, we can give up d4 to win like this this position where the pawn is queening so that's just one example of winning that position so black doesn't want that king and pawn then in, in a nutshell uh, he plays rook g8 and now white's a pawn up after all that rook g1 two pawns up yes doesn't look too good king d6 making way for d5 now rook on the seventh here again challenging that rook on the c file building a bridge for the king potentially now that's used king c6 to get the pawn over here d6 and now Savelli Tartagoa resigned it's a classic instructive endgame uh, annotated heavily by many annotators throughout history actually it's a classic because it has it shows dynamism dynamic play in the end game with this rook h1 it seems uh, with white's backward c pawn Capablanca played it in an almost outrageous fashion that it wasn't counterbalanced by g6 he allowed that to happen he ended up losing two pawns this one and this one in that game sequence but this gave started to give Capablanca a great reputation in end games that's a uh, as one of the best endgame players ever. This is one of the, the classics 
of his end game play. So not a wham bam, you know, sacrifice of of the dynamic school of chess. The players from the dynamic school, like cool. Capablanca is more from the static school of chess, the long term structural advantages, the end games, following in the footsteps of Steinitz, Smyslov, Karpov. These are more positional players. So don't expect anything too spectacular from this video. Sacrifices are aligned to a player's style of play and outlook. Capablanca's outlook was often winning end games. Okay, so let's see the next example I'd like to show you. Is against Professor Mark Fonorov, played in New York 1918. Fonorov is under big strain on his king side with this knight on f5. He plays rook a d8, and Capablanca shows great calculation skills here. Can you see what might played in this position? If I give you five seconds to pause the video. Okay, white played rook takes d6. Black plays now rook takes d6. And now we've won a pawn with bishop takes e5. But we're also hitting d6 and f6. If the rook moves now, that will be a disaster. The pin on the bishop, or the queen, in fact. We just take the queen. So what does black play here? Well, black sensed a vulnerability of the back row in this position, and played what seemed to be a very interesting tactic. He played actually the move rook d1. Now, from an engine point of view, this looks spectacular because it's a double attack on e1 and e5, right? So there's no time for bishop f6 or anything because we're going to get mated. If we take here on d1, surely that's no good. From an engine point of view of this position, by the way, there is a very interesting move queen a5 as an alternative which looks at e5 and e1 and apparently though white is still okay with bishop c3 here protecting e1 with this move but uh, it's not so fantastic as the game continuation this position here white has an advantage but it's not immediately crushing even if black has to give up the exchange in this position because of this double attack here so rook g6 having to give up the exchange but we end up with this position where it's not entirely crushing. Less than half a pawn advantage. But uh, black isn't the computer. Black played this, what seemingly a very lucrative move, rook d1. Capablanca takes on d1. And here, some issues become apparent. Black played bishop takes e5. fantastic bit of calculation now. A real backfire of the seventh rank of epic proportions here. It looks as though Black's back rank tactic was amazing. But Capablanca now plays check. And guess what he plays here in this position? If I give you five seconds to pause the video. Okay, Queen takes e5 creating a weakness of the last move actually on d8 because here what do you play as white? Knight takes f7 check so it'll be a knight up if the king moves otherwise black's king is getting mated on the back row real backfire here yeah, to get mated wow what great stuff very tactical. If queen takes e5, let's have a look at this question. In this position, knight h6 check again. And again, knight takes f7 works very well as a mechanism here because we still have that d8 to look forward to after queen takes e5. So we're still mating black on the back row potentially. After rook f8, rook takes. 
Okay, so yeah, fantastic combination there. New York, 1918. Let's go to 1914 in the next example. Capablanca is playing black. Now, white is looking forward to munching on C3 here, but perhaps this is not the best. White took on C3 and is technically a pawn up. Has Capablanca messed this position up? Why is it a pawn down? Well, he plays knight takes C3. After rook takes C3, he creates a kind of weakness of the last move again with rook takes C3. Because rook takes C3 is almost neglecting this back row again, back row issue example. What does black play here if I give you five seconds to pause the video? What would you play here? Okay. Queen b2, double attacking queen and rook, trying to get the queen away from d1. White had to resign here. Let's look at the various possibilities. If taking, then we back row mate white. If the king protects the queen, we can simply just take the rook. Rook up, thanks very much. If rook c2, we can play queen b1 check. If here, we can just take the rook, that's probably best, and then look forward to rook d1. It's absolutely decisive, this move. If rook c8, <laughs> what we can do here is throw in a check first. We don't want to lose the queen. We don't want to get back chromated, <laughs> back far in this game. Now what we do is, for example, queen a1 check, dragging the queen back. Then we take the queen, and then we take on c8. Rook up. Thanks very much. So this position, yes, it looks as though it's end of the game. It is pretty much end of game. Did we look at rook d3? Queen a1 check will do. Again, we can just exchange off queens here and win that rook. So, Ossip Bernstein, there, 1914. Let's go now to 1929. Capablanca had been pressing with a huge space advantage on both sides of the board here. Look at this pawn chain. Formidable. A V-shaped pawn chain. Classic against Carol Treble, 1929. So black is under great pressure. White is threatening. Rook takes b7. Black played knight d8. How does white make further progress here? If I give you five seconds to pause the video, what would you play here? Okay. Bishop a6. Yes, this is a loose piece in the position. Capitlank is immediately tapping into that. Not a real sacrifice, it's not taking risk, but it's, it's increasing the positional advantage in a riskless manner. Capitlank was not one to lose many games. And part of that, you know, he didn't place that many speculative sacrifices. Um, and th these are very logical based on already a huge positional advantage here. B takes, okay, so rook takes d7. With that, this pawn chain is a bit weaker. We've got a strong pass pawn here, potentially. Now, after rook e7, guess what Capablanca plays here? If I can give you five seconds. Okay. Rook takes d8. Yes, he doesn't mind this one because knight takes c6. Family fork. A lot of damage has been done here. Black resigned here. White's got two passed pawns after this. So say here, white takes here, takes two passed pawns. They're going to steamroll her. Black. It's hopeless. Okay, when Capablanca was 13 years old, this is a bit of a brilliancy. I've reserved to the final look. 
brief look at Kapilenko's sacrifices. Black seems to be cruelly going for White's king here. He's playing against Juan Cozo, the, the, the classic Kapilenko Corzo match played in Habana, Cuba, 1901. So he's trying obviously to attack Kapilenko. Corzo is one of the champions in the area. So the 13 year old Capablanca senses there's some king safety issues on this diagonal. He plays e6, first clever move. Now here, black could really have a disaster immediately if he's not careful. If bishop takes e6, what would you play in this position if I gave you five seconds here? Okay, rook takes e6 because we're celebrating this diagonal. So if takes, we've got d5 check, winning the queen. So Corzo here plays bishop b5, seemingly skewing queen and rook. Whoops, has the 13 year old faulted here? What is he doing? This is really bad, isn't it? Well, he's always got e takes f7, so it's not a total disaster, even if he moves his queen. Uh, there's, there's still a good game here for taking here. But uh, he plays a more spectacular idea. Guess what Cavablanca plays here? If I give you five seconds here. Okay, queen takes b5. Yes, a queen sacrifice. Everyone loves a queen sacrifice. Wow. Technically best actually was probably moving the queen from an engine point of view moving the queen is actually technically best. Um this this is very dangerous. If bishop takes we can take here. Say check. This this is a very, very good position for white. Uh say here there's d five check. It's very dangerous that diagonal still. So this this is dire straits for black as well. This so but the thirteen year old yeah plays with some risk here with queen takes b5. So what's the idea? Well he's still got d5 check. Very powerful diagonal. Still white is having huge compensation here. E takes f7. So now, okay, black is holding the e8 square for a moment. So there's no rook e8. What more is a concern here is just knight d4 gaining a key tempo, trying to get the queen away from e8, or even just hitting f5. We see that now, h6, knight d4. So black decided to counter sack the queen here. Let's have a look. If queen, black played this, if queen takes d5, rook e8 check, this is simple and strong. f8, just queen and getting another queen, <laughs> queen and queen recharge. So white would just be uh, two pieces up. So black counter sacks the queen. Rook takes f1. Rook takes f7. Well, white was now threatening knight takes f5. So, okay, rook takes f7. Rook takes f5, so we have some simplification here. So will the 13 year old be able to show he can win this position actually? After takes, knight takes. We only have knight and bishop versus rook. But we've got that passed d pawn. Capablanca, will he show that his great strength with passed pawns even at this early stage in his career? 1901. Knight e7. King g2. d6 now takes this, bishop e5, d7 now, and in this position, a beautiful move. What would you play here if I gave you five seconds to pause the video, starting from now? Okay, he plays knight g8 check. Now, if this is not taken, say here, well then there's bishop f6, say here, 
then there's knight f6 and white next is going to play this with the support of the knight there so say king f7 bishop c7 ouch but it's not much different from the game in any case rook takes g8 white now plays bishop f6 is going to be a bishop up king g6 he queens bishop up black plays on a bit to test his young opponent king e3 king c3 g3 now is played but uh, is this scary was this a blunder is the bishop going to be able to save against the pawn has the 13 year old blundered no bishop h4 bishop can zigzag like this okay now black must be feeling the pressure now white has to be careful here his bishop is on a dark square is the 13 year old aware of this that if he's just left with his a pawn potentially and this bishop it could be a draw Cap Blanket in this position is, is careful not to play a4 because he could end up drawing this game he hasn't got the right colour of a bishop he plays actually b4 here ok now black plays king e4 now king b6 he wants to keep his b pawn not the a pawn king d5 king d3 king c6 bishop goes back king d5 Capablanca is keen not to play b takes here this is a little trick as well if b takes this is going to become difficult to win surely these a pawns are virtually just like an a pawn with a8 once the king resides on a8 it's going to be tricky uh, so we see bishop h2 cutting the king off from d6 king d4 now if king b6 it's going to be trivial surely we just move the king here to d5 so black played a4 now king e5 king d5 yes using the zugzwang effect king c5 what is going to win this b pawn make sure he's got a b pawn a b pawn not an a pawn or even a doubled a pawn so fantastic technique from the young genius Jose Raul Capablanca I hope you enjoyed this video. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.